There is so much in the Gospel of John for the Passion. Much of his Gospel focuses on the farewell discourse and the Passion. And he presents Jesus as the divine Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. And Jesus knows everything that came, to, uh, that came about. He has his full trust in God and obedience to his Father's will is utmost in his mission. And he faces the crucifixion with great courage. He knew everything that was going to happen, it says. And then he fulfills the Jewish Passover. The night before he began the Passover, he completes it on the cross. In the Jewish Passover meal, it was four cups of wine. He had the cup of sanctification, the cup of proclamation, the cup of blessing, and the cup of consummation and our praise. And Jesus drank the four cup of wine on the cup, or on the cross. Jesus said, I thirst. And they handed him the wine on the hyssop stick, reminiscent of Exodus, when the people were in slavery in Egypt. They had to mark the doorpost with the blood of the lamb, so that the angel of death would pass through and not harm the children. Now Jesus takes the fourth cup with the hyssop and he bows his head and he says, it is finished. His death, his mission is accomplished. But if that was the end of the story, we wouldn't be here today. We have to take into account the resurrection, his glorification and his great commission. And that's very important. Another thing to consider is Jesus wore the seamless garment that they gambled for. The seamless garment was the garment of the high priest. So not only is Jesus suffering for us, he is the victim, he is the Paschal lamb, the Passover lamb, and he's also the priest offering the sacrifice. He is the great high priest. And back in the early part of the Gospel, John the Baptist presents Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now Jesus is crucified at the hour of sacrifice. And according to Josephus, the great historian said, 256,500 lambs were slain at the temple at the sixth hour when Jesus was sentenced to death. So it's a beautiful reminder. And then when Jesus was on the cross, he called his mother woman. Woman means the new Eve. Mary was given to us as our spiritual mother. So it's a beautiful passage to reflect on having a spiritual mother, Mary, as the new Eve. Eve brought disobedience and death. Mary brings Christ and salvation and love. So I'd like to share with you two of my favorite stories for Good Friday. One, back in 1975, I was a student in Ireland going to college and I needed money, so I went to England to work for the summer and I worked in a Roundtree Macintosh's factory in York City. And I was really amazed at the Catholic faith in York City. It was very, very strong. And I heard about the saint of the Eucharist, Margaret Middleton, back in 1558. She was put to death for harboring priests, hiding priests, so they could celebrate Mass in secret. And she was arrested and accused of the crime and asked, how do you plead? And she said, no crime has been committed, so no plea is necessary. And if you wouldn't plead, the way they put you to death was they took the door of your own house and they stripped you naked, laid you on a coal floor, put a bone or put a stone under your back, laid you on the stone, and then put the door on top of you and put about seven or eight hundred uh, pounds of rock on top of that and crush the life out of you. This happened 
on Good Friday. And today, she's a canonized saint. Everybody thought that would be the end of her, but she lives on. And before she died, she was asked if she had any last words. And she said, I pray that the Queen will become Catholic. And she also sent her, her shoes to her daughter and says, follow in my footsteps. And her children became priests and nuns. So it's a great story of a faithful saint. And the other story I love for Good Friday is the story about John Griffin. He was born in Oklahoma and his childhood ambition was to travel. As a young man, he wanted to travel the world. But then the Great Depression of the 1920s came and his native state, Oklahoma, was turned into a dust bowl. So he had to take his wife, his newborn son, Greg, and head out, hoping to be able to find a job, hoping to be able to survive. He eventually got a job in Missouri as a bridge tender, the railroad bridge spanning the Great Mississippi River. At certain times, he'd raise the bridge to let the ships go by, other times he'd lower it to let the trains go by, and he was basically happy in his job. In the summer of 1936, he took his seven-year-old son, Greg, to work with him for the very first time. And Greg was fascinated. He loved to watch the trains and the ships go by. He loved to watch his dad pull the right levers in order to open and close this big bridge. Around noon, John knew there wouldn't be any train coming for a while. So he raised the bridge to let the ships go by. And he took Greg up, up to the observation deck. And the two of them had a brown bag lunch. Very proud father, very proud son. They couldn't ask for more out of life. So happy together. Then all of a sudden, he heard the sound of a train whistling in the distance. He looked at his watch. It was seven minutes after one. He'd forgotten about the Memphis Express with 400 people on board. Right away, he jumped from the observation deck, ran down along the catwalk into the control tower, grabbed hold of the levers in order to close the bridge. He looked out underneath to make sure there was no ship. And when he did, a sight caught his eyes that brought his heart leaping to his mouth. Greg had fallen from the observation deck and his left leg was caught in the two main gears of the bridge. His mind whirled in panic as he heard the sound of the train getting closer. What was he to do? He was the Memphis Express with 400 people on board and this was his only son, his pride and joy. didn't have enough time to save his son and to save the four other people. He had to make a difficult choice. He closed the bridge, Greg was crushed in the steel, and the train rushed by. And with tears in his eyes, he looked at the people in the train carriages. He noticed businessmen reading their newspapers. Ladies were drinking coffee and chatting. Children were eating ice cream and playing, and in wretched agony, John Griffin called out the blood steam train. Don't you care? I sacrifice my son for you. No one hurt him, and the train rushed by. I love that story because I think God must often call out those same words to us. With all the craziness that goes on in the world, and all of the people who don't want God in our world, and all the people who don't want Jesus. How God must be disappointed that he sent his only son, who willingly died for us on Good Friday, so that we may live better and live for one another. And instead of accepting Jesus, we reject him.